All right. Hello, everybody. Good evening. Does everybody hear me all right? Oh, perfect. So I'd like to welcome you. Very warm welcome from The Alternative. Uh, this is Tox. My name is Sandro. And together, we are part of one of uh, the students' associations at ETH Zurich. We are part of Project 21. Uh, if you know Project 21, uh, you probably know that they are a sustainability student association of Uni Zurich, University of Zurich, and ETH Zurich. And we are the digital branch of them. So what we do is that we live digital sustainability. Basically, that means preserving information, which is, in our case, software, uh, in order to be able to reuse it later on in a more sustainable way. And so free software. Who has been to the free software course, by the way? Quite a few. So you should by now know why free software is called sustainable. Uh, for everybody else, it doesn't matter. We have a recording of that. So you can always watch it later if you uh, want to. So today, uh, I have a very specific goal. We're going to be uh, much more concrete than uh, Christian was on the last one. It's not so philosophical, but it's really uh, an example of free and open source software, which is Linux. Um, well, first of all, I have to say there are two ways to say Linux. One is Linux, the other one is Linux. Choose what you want. No one really knows what it's pronounced, and there are really wars going on about this topic. So I guess you can just choose for yourself. So my goal today for you is that if you have never seen or touched Linux, you go home feeling as if you had already have contact with Linux. So it's kind of a first touch for you, your first time. Even though you're just seeing a presentation, I want you to feel like you actually lived it. Um, and what I expect from you is, of course, that you're curious, that you're interested, and that you are ready uh, to think a little bit out of the box that you are doing right now. So overview of this course. Uh, at the first thing, we can tell you what Linux is. It's a fairly simple. Well, it's not very deep what we're going to do here. I'm going to fly over the topics a little bit. It would be a little bit boring, else if I go too much in detail. And then we're going to talk about Linux distros. Who knows what a Linux distro is? Whoa, that's not that much. OK, so it's going to be interesting. And then we have a package manager. Who has heard about a package manager? Who has heard about an app store? OK, so you all have heard about package managers just on a mobile phone. Uh, then we're going to talk about desktop environments. So finally, we're going to have a quick glance at the installation process. And of course, we're going to show you what our next events are going to be. There's going to be a Q&A session at the very end of this. Um, I don't know if we're going to have a microphone for the Q&A. No. So um, yes, you will. You, uh, by the way, yes, you might be recorded by this camera. I hope that's all right with you. Else you have to talk to us afterwards so we can blur you out. That's just, uh, it will be uh, licensed as a Creative Commons uh, thing. So, um, if you have any questions, uh, you can immediately ask them. And else, if there are more advanced questions, you just wait for the Q&A. And of course, there's a whole team of us. We have at least, I see, six people of us, and they're all ready to answer your questions. Yes? This presentation is also recorded, so... Yes. That's correct. The presentation is being recorded. That's why we have all these. Yes, yes. We will upload it as soon as possible. Um, we will link it from our website. Okay. So basically, Linux is a, an entire world of mentalities, philosophies, even cultures. Uh, it's a very, very vast theme. You can have a technological way of seeing it. You can have a philosophical way of seeing it. And there are really religious wars going on. So I'm uh, going to show you different phases. First of all, if you have never used Linux in your life, Please stand up now. It's kind of a relax. Don't be afraid. All right. That's quite a few people. You just you keep standing. Keep standing. Keep standing. <laughs> oh, it's so so much sport this time of day. I'm so sorry. So you can sit down if you have used one of the following. Okay. First is this little device. I'm not talking about the cashier. I'm talking about the machine. This one. So you can sit down if you have used that. Oh, there's not that much people standing anymore. OK. Uh, this particular machine, I mean, because it has a Linux on it. Uh, if you have used this machine, oh, and nobody's standing anymore, except for the people who don't have a seat. Well, then I guess you have all used Linux in your life already. And the one thing for letting down everybody is it would probably be this, which is uh, the internet. The internet is basically run on Linux. For, for a base part of it. 
So almost everybody also have a Linux system at home. In your TV, it's very likely that you have some kind of Linux-inspired version or that you really have a true Linux system. Or uh, this thing, uh, VRT54GL, uh, it's a, a router which you can flash on with your own personal Linux. It's kind of a little computer. And also the stock version is also based on Linux. And very, very most routers are based on a Linux distro. You can even log yourself in and the commands that you will learn will also work in that. You won't learn it today, don't worry. But you will learn it in the Linux in practice course. And of course you can have Linux on a normal computer like this laptop, uh, which is currently running Ubuntu Linux, uh, which is the most popular distro. We have not chosen this semester to have Ubuntu, but we will officially recommend OpenSUSE. Now, if you're a big Ubuntu fan, please don't be too disappointed. We also support Ubuntu. We have a great amount of knowledge about Ubuntu because we have used that in the previous semesters. So um, you're free to use whatever you want. We go with our recommendation. We explain you the things specific to OpenSUSE, but that does not mean that you cannot use what you want. And most commands are generic. There are very few differences which are really, really different, you know. So uh, if PCs were cars, the actual street world or computer world would look a little bit like this. So we have this extremely stylish car from Microsoft. And then we have this uh, even more stylish Apple kind of looking thing. Um, by the way, uh, the pictures are not uh, mine. They ha I have put uh, references down there in case you're interested to download that for yourself. Anyway, you don't see much Linux, do you? The only talks you see heard is probably the one below there. So, um, on the PC world, Linux is not very well established yet. It is going upwards very fast, faster than ever, actually. But it's mostly run on servers. And you will probably, in two hours, not understand why that's the case. I don't understand it either, because uh, in my opinion, a Linux system is much less of a, of a hassle to, to deal with if you just want to use it for every day. So if PCs were cores, the Linux system would not be an operating system. It would not be a car. It would just be an engine. We said a Linux is a kernel. Kernel is kind of a basic thing within a car, uh, within an operating system that drives all the things. All the software, all the, the processes communicate with that thing. It gets information back of it. And the kernel also supervises everything. It checks that nobody does something they're not allowed to, etc. So it's it serves as a base and it coordinates everything. That's why I say it's an engine. Now, there's not much you can do with an engine alone. I mean, you can go have a seat on it, and yeah, you won't go very far, right? So what you want is probably tires. You want a steering wheel. You want some kind of gas tank, etc. So that makes a car. And there's a whole bunch of software that is bundled around the Linux in order to make it a full-size operating system. And you can imagine that there are many, many different ways of adding software to that and many different mentalities of what kind of software you want to use with that. I mean, do you want a Windows-style start menu, or do you prefer something like Mac OS-ish, where you press a button and then Spotlight pops up? Uh, you know, there's no clear answer to that. It's, it's kind of about religion. So what you have to do is you have to pick your own. And as Linux is free software, everybody can just pick it and do it around. So now we have what we call distributions. Distribution is a software bundle, which is Linux distribution is based on Linux. That's why it's called Linux distribution, um, in case you wonder. And that's, that's what makes things interesting. There are many, many, many operating systems which are Linux-based. Some are for routers, uh, some are for computers, some are for servers, some are for many things. Or also, for some are, one is, well, it's not exactly Linux distribution, but there is one, something based on Linux, which is called Android. So maybe you've heard of that. It's not, it's not a Linux. Android is not Linux anymore, but it's based on it. So who owns the right to Linux? I mean, Windows is owned by Microsoft. or I suppose OS X is uh, Apple's property. Who owns Linux? The thing is, you all own it. It's public property. Linux is licensed as free software. I won't go into detail with that. You can always check uh, the video from the day before yesterday's recording. It's a license under the GNU GPL uh, license, and it will actually be free forever. So that's a really cool thing. You won't ever have to pay for Linux itself. Uh, yeah, I'm going to stop about that. So who makes Linux? I have to say many, many people make Linux. I have no clue if that is uh, taken from actually a software developing uh, 
kind of event, but I see many men and few women, so I guess that is probably an authentic picture of what would like a meeting of many, many, many developers who develop for Linux and programs associated to that when they come together. And none of them, or most of them, are not paid for that. They don't earn any money. So how does all this work? The thing is, when I myself want to have great software, I get this software for free, but when it's free software. I take it, and I use it. Like, for example, the program that is rendering this right now, all this is uh, LibreOffice, LibreOffice, whatever you call it. Uh, it's, it's the same thing as OpenOffice, but OpenOffice project is dead and LibreOffice lives on. So uh, maybe you've heard of that. Actually, I'm using this, and there are some things I dislike. Now, as I'm a programmer, I can write my own pieces of software to that. I can change things which are in that, because as it's free software, I get access and the rights to modify this software. That's a really, really cool thing, because I just modify it whatever I want. I mean, you take your car, you change a tire to a pink one, if you want a pink tire, uh, and you can do fancy things if you, if you know how to. But the problem is now, for me, as I have done that with a GPL licensed software, I myself, I am obliged, uh, I must provide that software for free. Again, guaranteeing the same rights as the rights that were guaranteed to me with my software. And now imagine if 100,000 people do that. Everybody, it's like science, everybody takes the previous things that they got, they build their own to it, and they have to give it back to the community. So there's a whole huge bunch of software that is everywhere, everywhere. I, I say most of you wear a device where it is. That is not on for anybody because it's on for everybody. And every time somebody adds to something to it, they have to give it again. So where's the money in all that? I mean, they have to run on servers. Servers cost money. Actually, you have several ways of doing that. First way is sponsoring. You just, like crowdfunding is one thing. Or, uh, I mean, there are many, many, uh, hello. There are many enterprises which are very interested in uh, getting Linux to work well, for example, uh, server hosters, etc. They want this to be good, so they put a lot of money into the projects. Also, uh, we have a very interesting concept, which is, for example, Red Hat. Red Hat is a company, and what they do is they have their own Linux distribution, which is called Fedora. That's the thing that is installed on ETH. Uh, no, well, Fedora is, is the free version, but you also have the Red Hat Linux. And to get Red Hat Linux, you don't have to pay. They cannot legally make you pay for it, but they can tell you, well, we can support you officially. Like, they built that distribution, they develop software for it, and they will uh, guarantee that it works. If it doesn't work, they come to you and they fix it for you. And they will charge you money for that. So with the support, they make the money, and that money goes back into the software, which then has to be redistributed for free, and that's the distribution called Fedora. Um, you don't have to remember all that. It's just so, so that you know where Fedora comes from, in case you're interested. So uh, nothing really is free, but at the same time, if everybody is interested in doing things that are free, there's enough money around to keep this ship going. The, the alternative, we don't get any money of that either. We do about the same thing. We just love to do it, right? There are many, many programmers who have that as well because it's so awesome. And I hope, I hope maybe in a few weeks you will, you will find out the, the awesomeness. So um, the cool thing for you is you don't have to deal with a company. You don't have to ask... Okay, you don't have to ask a company where it says, for example, well, have you tried restarting your computer as a standard bot reply? No one has even read your problem. They will automatically generate for you this reply. I don't know. There's a big, big company out there. I won't tell its name, but you might have experienced this kind of replies. Very, very frustrating. Now, Linux, you are talking to the developers themselves. When you file a bug report, or if, you, if you go to a forum, as, you are, uh, as, as the developers are their own users, because if you're a developer, you use Linux, and then you find something is not right with it, you change it, then you become a developer. The whole thing is interconnected. There's no such thing as client and, and supplier, because everything is mixed. Uh, that's what makes it awesome, because when you go to the forum, you have a good chance that an actual developer will read your request, your issue, whatever. Now, if that's a small thing, I mean, anybody can help you, so they will, just like normal forums, you know, they will tell you, well, have you pressed this thing, and you do it, and it just works, and you say, oh, I'm so stupid. But if you have a major issue, something that is really problem with the software, then uh, you have, if it's an interesting problem that concerns many people, you have a good chance that actually a developer will read it, and what developers do is develop, so they might fix their, your problem personally. 
So there's no, no profit, need of profit, just, you know, everybody wants to have this software for quality. And you actually get, get to feel that a lot when you use this software. The communities uh, are very, very strong and they hold together very tight. What binds these communities is a mentality. It is a, a vision of what good software should be. And you will figure out in the next, in about half an hour, you will know many, many different ways of what good software can be, which are absolutely contradictory. So, yeah. Anyway, so this brings us directly to distribution. Distribution is a bunch of people who have this same vision, but it's also a bunch of software which is bundled together in something you can download. You can put it on a CD, you can put it on a USB drive, you can install it on your laptop. Distribution is basically an operating system, a full-sized operating system which, will, um, which you can install on your computer, which you can use. And also, it's a um, well, very, very based kind of thing. So what we have this year, as I said, OpenSUSE. OpenSUSE comes in many flavors. So even though it's one distribution, it's so big that the people within the distribution split up in subcamps. So imagine if Linux was religion. OK, don't, don't take me seriously on that. Many people will hate that I say it this way. If Linux was the religion, then it will probably be the Catholics and the Methodists and so on. But then you have, or, or let's say the Christians and the Muslims and so on. But then the Christians, we have a subcategory. Because, I mean, they have kind of the same God, but some of them uh, are kind of pro-Jesus. Some don't like that Jesus thing all that way. So it's split up in Catholics, uh, Protestants, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And this is the same thing. You have the distributions, which are really the major thing. What people you communicate with, where, what servers you rely on, who you get to, to interact with, what, what your, what kind of what, what your vision is, where, where we want to go. Do we want stable software that has proved itself reliable? Or do we want something experimental, really brand new, which, is, which crashes all five minutes, but hey, it's new and I want to test it? I mean, depending on your device, you can be both. So we'll have two different uh, distributions, one on each device with each mentality. And within the distribution, if you say, uh, for example, I go the midway, which is kind of stable but still not too old, then uh, you have many, many different ways of doing that. Where do, do I want to click to have a start menu? Do I want to press a button? What is, what is kind of the feel that that distribution is, is giving me? Uh, and there you have the so-called desktop environments, which will fix that. So we will talk about that, uh, that in a second as well. So if you install OpenSUSE the standard way, which is what we recommend on a reasonably powerful machine, you will get this. Um, you have a web browser, which is Firefox, and you have a desktop environment, which is called KDE. But there are many, many different distributions, uh, symbolized here by this, whoop, I'm sorry, figure, symbolized by this little uh, kind of uh, family picture. Um, looks kind of like you can keep the overview. Uh, actually, if you have a distribution timeline, it looks like the thing to the left. So there is a lot of distributions outside, that's what you might think. Uh, I'm sorry, you are quite wrong. If you just look at the little box I dotted in the top, and you zoom in a little bit, this is what you get. Uh, and that's like, what, a quarter of this picture? So there are many, many, many distributions outside. You will never get to test them all. There are thousands of distributions. There's, for example, Red Star Linux, I think it's called. That's North Korean government, which is developing that. You might not want to try that out. Um, you can also, there's also some Chinese things, um, or there are distributions which open, like OpenSUSE, which you probably want to try out. And then, uh, yeah, many, many things. Hi. So you will choose what, where, what way to go, and we will install, if you want, whatever you tell us to install on your computer, um, if it can be done within two hours. If you go with Gen2 or Linux from scratch, which is not even a distro, we might not be able to do it in time. But if you have a favorite, you just do it. We're going to help you with that. Um, if you don't know what to pick, go with OpenSUSE. That's our recommendation. We think that's a good choice to start with. And then you will never stay with your distribution. You always move on because you see something cooler. Your friend will always have a cooler distribution than you do. That's, that's about religion. Uh, I got stuck with Arch Linux personally. So that, anyway. So one very important thing about distribution is the so-called package manager. A package manager is kind of like the app store you have on your iPhone or the, what's it called, uh, Play Store, Google Play Store on your Android phone or Windows Store on your Windows phone. Um, but it's on a computer, and it's extremely more powerful than what you think it is. Actually, uh, all these stores that you get are very downgraded, simplified 
kind of powerless things that bind you to the company that is running them. Of course, on the Linux world, it looks a little different. It's much bigger, much more diverse, and you get much more control over what you have. So Package Manager basically is responsible for managing software on your computer. Software is put in so-called packets, or packages, depending on what you call them. Uh, the package, for example, contains, say, Firefox. That's one program in, in a package. Uh, or it can also contain several programs, like there is the package Image Magix, which is a whole bundle of software tools that will help you converting images, rotating them, recolorizing them, uh, doing really everything that has ever been possible to do in an image. So there's a lot of programs containing this single package. And you just don't download them yourself, usually, on a normal, on a standard distro that we're going to recommend, but you just ask your package manager to do that for you. So how does it know what software is out there? It has channels, so-called uh, repositories. A repository basically is, uh, if, let's, yeah, well, I, I would call it a channel. And we know that on this channel, there is that and that and that and that packet, which is offered in that and that and that version. And usually, there is one version for a packet for a channel. For a I'll say repo now. That's the short version of a repository. There are many ways uh, to have repositories. First of all, the the, most, the safest ones are the official repositories. That is software that, was dev that is developed, actively being developed by the community that runs your distro. And this is kind of certified to be secure, to be stable, to be good. Uh, you, you can really trust these packages. Then we have the community projects. Um, for example, there is a, a community project which is called uh, VLC, I think. That is not being developed by OpenSUSE. It's, is that wrong? Don't use it, yeah. Yes, um, that's about religion as well. Uh, yes, VLC can be good, can be bad. It's free software, so I, I can safely talk about it, I think. But if you want to use VLC, your distro might not officially support that. So what you do is that you're going to have another repository with software that your community builds. Not the official ones, not the gremium of the, of the distribution with the hardcore people which are full in, but the people a little bit around it. And then, if that's still not enough, you can have so-called personal repos. Personal repos, you can do them yourself, very, very simple. You just tell the server, this is my package, this is my source code, compile it for me, distribute it for me, and it's going to do it all by itself, and you're going to be very happy about that. And everybody can just add your repository to their software sources, and the package manager is going to handle it. So, why is that so important? It's because all these are grouped together in so-called software sources. So once you have configured that file, and you can always change that file, of course, you don't have to worry about it anymore. All these repositories will be grouped into one kind of big globe source that is hanging on top of you constantly. And you can pull down software from that, whatever you want. And norm so a standard configuration has several tens of thousands of packages that you can choose from. There's uh, really not much software you want to install in your Linux, which your package manager is not able to do. And if it is not, then you can always add a repo with, with that particular software. So why is a package manager so cool? It's because it's extremely fast. I install uh, Firefox on this machine on Windows in, I don't know, 20 seconds, 30 seconds, or if I have a hard disk, maybe several minutes. On my Linux, it takes me two or three seconds to install Firefox. Very fast. Uh, the other thing is that it's safe. Because it's, well, it's as safe as your repositories. You don't have to pick a setup every single time you have to download something. But you get your packages from somewhere you can trust. If, if the official repository or also community projects are kind of trustworthy. Official repository is very trustworthy, in my opinion. You can always discuss that. You can always switch to a safer or less safe distribution. That's, if you're really paranoid, you're going to have uh, all the possibilities of being paranoid. I guarantee you. Maybe you don't want to do that. Maybe you do. Anyway, um, so I say it's secure. Uh, there's no junkware. And this is, this is really something relieving. You have no setups. You just tell the package manager, install this. It tells you, oh, just wait. Tuck, it's installed. There is no buttons to click, and there is absolutely no chunkware that comes onto your system. No toolbars, uh, no special search engines, no configurations you want to avoid. So no one has interest of kicking you something you don't want back with it, right? 
So that's cool. And another very neat thing of that is that updates are managed by the package manager as well. So if I want to install updates on this machine, all I do is I open that window, I say FU, which is fast update. And my, uh, that's, well, it's, it taps nice because you could just, anyway. And it does the updating. For all software installed on this computer, within seconds. It checks for updates, it downloads the updates, and it installs it for the operating system itself, for all installed packages, for my browser, for my email client. I mean, it even, it even updates my libraries and everything. So I don't have any kind of pop-ups that come up on my system annoying me. Also, I don't have to reboot. My Linux system typically, well, actually, I don't know anywhere, but that wouldn't be the case. You don't have to reboot your system after that you installed or uh, installed updates or packages, whatever. Very, very convenient thing. And you don't, when you turn on your computer, you know it's going to start up without saying, please wait while updates are installing, one of 206. <laughs> so you can also tell your package manager, install me uh, these 500 applications. Hit enter, add your password, you go have a coffee. You come back, see packages are installed, you're done. It's pretty nice. And if you have 500 updates, they install very, very quickly. So that's, um, that's why package manager is good. I say package manager is your friend. Uh, you're going to love it. Anyway, this is what Package Manager might look for you. Uh, very simple. This is the uh, KDE uh, Package Manager thing. There's a search field. You type in there what you want to search for. I, for example, Firefox. You hit Enter, and it will tell you if it's not installed to install it, or if it's installed to remove it. And you press OK, and you're done. Of course, you can do that at console. Uh, we're going to talk about that on the next slide. Uh, but if you, if you like click, aim, and point, uh, you're going to have very, very simple things for that. And then there will be a message, hey, there are new updates available. And you click install, and that's it. <coughs> so you're done. So um, this is about it for the package manager things. Now we're going to go to deeper things. Any questions to that? No. Now it's the part I like, the console. So who thinks consoles are old-fashioned? Come on, you can bear it. You can. You, you think consoles are old-fashioned? You all think consoles are really modern. Like this looks like a modern operating system, right? Okay, no one has lifted up the hand for the first and just a few for the second. Question. What do you think? What do you think about consoles? Come on. Are you? Asleep? So wait, what? It frightens, me. it frightens you. Yes, that's what I want you to hear. So I'm, gonna, I'm here to tell you consoles are the easiest thing in the universe. It's just, it threatens you because the opposite of a UI, a GUI graphic user interface, uh, based apps, the console will not tell you what your options are. You don't have five buttons to choose from. You have to know what you want. You have to think first, and then you type in your command. So this is what the console is frightening for beginners. But... You will get these commands very, very, very fast into your brain. And we're going to help, we're going to help you with that. We're going to do a lot of console working on the practice courses. So once you know that, you know exactly what you want to tell the computer. You don't have to say, oh, hang on. I have to first tell it that I want something in edit, then that I want uh, something in find and replace. And then in this submenu, I want to replace. And yes, I do want the, ca the case to be respected, and I have an entire word. And then you start typing what you actually want. The console, you don't have to do that. You know what you want, so you type in a command that is exactly what you want. Also, you can chain commands. You can change five commands. Like, you can say, I want to list all the different screens on my computer. OK, now I want to take off that list only the lines which says uh, connected, so that I don't get the disconnected screens. And I want only the first word of that. And with that, now I want to make this my primary screen. And you can always chain these commands together, and they will form a new compound command, which is very, very, very nice. So now I have this, and I press one button, and the system will automatically put my screen wherever I want it, with one button. You can map things all the way. This is why console is so extremely powerful, because all the commands that you have on your computer will be able to be compatible with each other, right? Also, you can type. You don't have to aim. You don't have to say, oh, this is the button I want. You just type. Your fingers, you, they feel right the keyboard. That's very, very efficient once you know what you want. So it's very responsive as well. Um, if you have ever worked on a 
very slow machine which has run for quite a while and got slower. Um, I have to say a Windows machine because all other dis uh, operating systems that I know don't get slower with the time, just Windows does it. But if you've worked, if you experienced that, you click something and you wait for the window to open. On the console, you don't have that. You just go tap, tap, and immediately it shows you all the options that you have for completing the command you start typing now. Very, very, very fast. You'll, you'll see. So that's why I love the console so much. It gives me exactly what I want. And I work most of the time I work in the console. Also, you can have your own shortcuts defined, et cetera, et cetera. So right now, I'm just promising you, you don't have to be afraid of the console. You don't have to be frightened. But in two weeks, I'm going to demonstrate you that you don't have to be afraid. So just come. I, 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 uh, how, do you, how do you say that? I, uh, I dare you, right? You will not be afraid anymore. So let's, let's come to philosophy, to religion. Uh, now we can hit each other. And I have to say, first of all, this is my opinion about things. Many, many people disagree with that, what I'm going to say next. And you will feel really some preferences I have and some preferences I don't really have. So this is KDE. I hate KDE. But KDE is very nice for people who come from Windows because it has a start menu. Um, it has here windows that actually look like windows with a close button, maximize button, things, etc. And it's extraordinarily customizable. I mean, you can make these uh, checkboxes. You know, everybody knows their checkboxes. You can make the checkboxes look round, triangular, or squared if you want. You can just customize everything. That means that the options dialogs are huge. That's uh, something I particularly dislike. Something else I dislike is that windows fade in and they fade out just like on a Windows system. And a new with from Windows 7, of course. I don't like that. I like kind of the XP feel where it just goes boom, 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 boom all the time. Now, what you prefer, uh, it, it doesn't matter to me what you prefer because you know now that if you want fancy things, customizable things, you have to choose KDE. Now, note that KDE runs on machines with, I would recommend, at least two gigabytes of RAM. If your machine is older than that, wait for two minutes. We're going to show you more simplistic when, uh, desktop environments. KDE is extremely complete, I have to say. Well, we have Dolphin, which is a file manager, which you see there, which can do a lot of things. It handles networks, it handles window splits, uh, et cetera. So it booksmarks things, you can sign things. It has a full-featured um, email client with everything that you could dream of if you're a Microsoft Outlook user, et cetera. Uh, and it has a big, customizable uh, settings thing. So, KDE is big and very complete. Now, if that's too much for you, but you still want something very smooth, you might rather go with GNOME. GNOME is kind of the Mac OS uh, desktop environment style of Linux. Uh, it's, it comes as it is. You have exactly the options that you have and not much more. It's very minimal. Um, well, this is not the newest version. There still is a minimize and a maximize button. But what the GNOME uh, people said is... Actually, to minimize a window, well, why would you minimize a window? You just want to switch to another window. You just see your desktop. But you don't ever want to minimize a window just for sake of minimizing it, right? So they kill it. There's no more minimize button. Maximizing. Why would you maximize a window if you can just drag it to the top? So you don't need it. So they kill it. This is why GNOME, I say, is minimalistic. They remove everything that you don't use in your daily life. Also, they remove the start menu. And they built this thing, and this is really fancy. Oh, well, this is kind of when you want to see all the windows, you move your mouse on the top left, and everything scales down, and then you see little tiny windows of everything that you have open. If you have too many windows on this so called workspace, just drag them to another workspace, and they will be dynamically created. Whereas KDE, for example, what I showed you before, uh, will have static workspaces where you define in advance how many workspaces you have. On GNOME, that's not possible because they create themselves as you move things around, et cetera. And also, the application starter is you move your mouse to the top left, you have these windows. If you start typing now, it will become a start menu. So why would you need a start menu? That's kind of the way. GNOME, either you like it or you hate it. If you love it, you go with it. Try it out. It's really worth it. And if you hate it, uh, then uh, you switch to something else. Uh, actually, there are four machines back there, maybe even five, and they all run actually a Linux with all these desktop environments I'm presenting to you. At the end of this course, feel free to go back and try it out yourself. Then there's XFCE. Now, this is the first smaller desktop environment I'm going to show you. 
Um, XFCE, I call it sometimes X phase. Uh, it's a religious question, whatever it is called, and there are contradictory information about that in the internet. But I say X phase, so don't get me wrong on that. It's very minimalistic in the sense of it doesn't come with anything that takes a lot of computational power that you won't need. For example, on default, there are no effects. Windows just pop open and pop closed. Um, there's not much decoration. Uh, there, here's transparency enabled, but by default, that's not even the case. Things are small, things are tiny, but still, it kind of provides everything that you are used to from, uh, from a normal operating system. Uh, it has done a lot of progress in the last two years for that. If you have used XFCE before, you should probably try it out again. It has some interesting features which are new. It runs on older machines. Uh, I think you can easily get along with uh, one gig of RAM with that, and it's kind of fast, you know. It has also a bundle of software that comes with it, which is minimalistic as well. Uh, in the sense of not not like the GNOME minimalistic, but just the the what, what it what it demands the hardware. And then there's LXD. Now this is one I don't like of the two small ones, um, but I like FC, XFC a lot. I used it for quite a while. LXDE is what you take if you have even less powerful computer, like 500 megs of RAM. Uh, it has a start menu that looks like this. Uh, XFC has one of those too, but it also provides a, a slightly more modern start menu now. LXD is really mm, kind of the lowest you can get in terms of resources while still having something that feels like an operating system you're probably used to. You can go much lower than that. Like the one that is running here right now even takes less resources, but there's, uh, there's no file manager, there's no start menu, there's uh, no such thing at all. I don't... Uh, I, don't, I cannot even maximize or minimize windows. That doesn't exist on mine. But this is the lowest you can get without going into so-called uh, tiling window manager or minimal window manager. If you want to go even lower, try Openbox, but then you have already to, to use the console because Openbox has many things that it doesn't provide in the graphical in, environment. Anyway, so if you have an old machine, start with LXD and work your way down, optimizing away things you don't need. So um, this is what they looked like, but you can change a lot of things. So XFCE looks like this if you install it by default. Uh, not on OpenSUSE, they have themed it, but this is the original. And then you can, you can make it look like that. You see there's a kind of Mac OS-ish uh, bar, and you can install that one on top of this and just replace this one. I mean, there's nothing in your, in your desktop environment you cannot replace by something else, right? If you want a custom start menu, you have a dozen of choices or even more. And also, um, you have a lot of notifications and things and so on. And you see that the, actually the theme looks the same as on KDE. So you can combine desktop environments features in order to make your kind of own desktop environment being based on one of them. Or you just build your own if you're more very, very, very more advanced user. Uh, I wouldn't be able to. And then this is KDE. Um, this is what it looks like on OpenSUSE. You've seen that before. You can make it look like this if it, if it amuses you. If you're like a designer and you spend your whole time uh, making things look prettier, then you can do that. So this is about desktop environments. Did you get a feel more or less what they are? Because if you don't, absolutely try out these things in the back. They're, you can really play around with them. Uh, they are left on default, so... This is what you get when you install OpenSUSE with all of these. Actually, when you install OpenSUSE, it will ask you what desktop environment to choose from. And these are the four top choices that we would recommend you. And then you have this. Um, that is the release cycle. Actually, you know, uh, on a Mac, that would be Snow Leopard has died and you shouldn't be using it anymore. Oh, bad news for some of you. Uh, or Windows XP, you cannot use it anymore. It has died. It has no more support. What does that mean? It means that people are not developing it anymore for security fixes. If there's a problem to the software, it will not be fixed. You have to get a newer operating system like Windows Vista, which is the last one still being supported. And OpenSUSE has that, of course, as well. Um, here, uh, the versions are labeled from 10.0 to what is, I think right now is 13.2 is the, the current version. Uh, is that correct? Yes, okay. This is uh, the old release cycle, which is stopping as of a few weeks from now. So you, has, you see you had about this much support, which is oh, 
little over two years, there's the green, gray zones or development. So it's not ready to use yet. Then comes the green one, which is uh, the official support. And then they have the evergreen phase, which is if you don't want to switch to a newer system, you can still keep it. They kind of support it. That was it uh, until then. And then when this end comes, you better upgrade to, to one of the, the versions later on. Upgrading, of course, is for free, and your package manager will all do it for you. Just press one button. And no, there will no be, not be any error messages like on some other operating systems. I've, I've never seen them. And now it's uh, like this, that every release comes every eight months. Uh, and there's, uh, each release is supported for the next two releases plus two months. So it's a total of 18 months. And Evergreen, as I say, is for people who really don't want to switch by that time. And then the new cycle uh, looks like this. So it's called OpenSUSE Leap. And so far, it's only, it will only be available for 64-bit uh, uh, computers. So it's kind of uh, very new. So they will maybe extend it to 32-bit later on. Most of you, anyway, have a 64-bit computer, even if you don't know it. And uh, a minor release is labeled with a dot one at the end, and it's supported 18 months. But this time, we have 12 months between the releases. And there is a major release. For those who know Ubuntu, it's kind of the LTS thing. And a major release will be at least every 36 months until actually the next major release it will be supported. So you don't have to upgrade for 36 months. Right? Any questions to that? All clear? This is a detail, but it gets nasty if you forget to upgrade, and then there's a like heart bleed will not be fixed on outdated versions. Uh, for those who know that, they know how bad it can be. So always make sure you are in support. So now we're going to install Linux, maybe. Oh, I skipped one. Sorry. So Tux won't be breaking your OS. Uh, it's not that you should be too afraid of uh, it overwriting your actual OS. If you have a Mac OS or Windows OS, you can keep it on your computer. And if you want to install OpenSUSE, you can install it aside. Uh, this is what it's going to look like. First of all, the installer will tell you that it's going to shrink the Windows partition. So making Windows smaller is a critical part. Uh, resizing a partition, for those who know it, it's kind of critical if you're... If you, someone like let down, fall down your laptop to the floor at that point, it's very likely that you have a complete data loss. So if you install your system, first of all, do a backup, OK? Also, you might press something wrong and then choose the wrong target and choose to override everything on purpose, but without wanting it. The installer does what you tell it to do. So it's good to do a backup, even though it's considered safe. And then once you have installed it aside, you can choose from your OS. Um, this is what the chooser looks like on Windows. When you start up your machine instead of uh, the Windows logo, this pops up. Now you say, oh, I want to start OpenSUSE, or I want to say start Windows. And the cool thing is both are completely, absolutely uncoupled. They have nothing to do with each other. And they are, one will not slow down the other one. You can even leave, well, it's not recommended, but you can even leave one in Hibernate and start the other one. But don't do it. Uh, yes, and on a Mac it looks like this. Uh, this is refit. This is an additional software you need to have. Uh, it's harder to install it on a Mac. Don't worry, we have a huge team of very experienced people for doing that. So it's like kind of having two computers in one. If you have one killed by a virus, that would be typically not the Linux part. <laughs> Sorry, I had to say that. Then actually you have to... Uh, you don't have to, to do anything to the other one. The other one is completely independent. Actually, if a Windows virus is on your Windows, it will not be able to run on your Linux system. It's incompatible, so it's kind of a neat thing. And also, if one system is broken, if you, you will still have your other one. So you're going to be perfectly fine with that. Also, if you have spy software uh, like um, Windows 10 installed in your computer, the Linux part <laughs> will not be affected by this. So um, if, you look, if you start up Windows, you will not see Linux. If you start up Mac, you will not see Linux. It does not even recognize the partition type. However, uh, Linux will recognize the other operating system. And it looks like it's a USB key. Uh, it's, like, it's like a second hard disk, and you can move around any file that you want. Hey, hey, hallelujah, the Windows protection is completely turned off. So you can just press delete on your Windows folder, and it 
gets deleted nicely. So watch out. And uh, as I say, systems are completely independent. Oh, I, I pre pwned that. I guess you don't need to break, because we're going to be done in about 10 minutes, so you have enough time. Anybody really needs a break now? No, OK, OK. So I have this, this pie chart to, to symbolize that. And here will be uh, the Windows main partition. This would kind of be your bootloader partition. And then we have, in this case, three Linux partitions. You can imagine it like this. And they're completely apart, which is a nice thing. So what you can do now in order to get Linux is to visit our next event, which is the so-called install event. Now, what the install event looks like is that there are tables and routers with LAN cables and a lot of people. I think this year, a huge amount of people. And then we have helpers, and they run around. And you get, a, you get a piece of paper, and you sit down with that piece of paper and your laptop. Bring a charger, OK? Just put up your laptop. You read the piece of paper, and you do what's written on it. And as soon as you run into a problem, if you're not sure about something, if you feel insecure or something, you lift up your hand. And eventually, somebody will come by and help you tell you whatever it is. Done. Now, if you have a serious problem, there are some computers which are really, really nasty to get Linux installed on. Then this someone might get someone else. We have so little bands this year with, uh, you know, kind of like the medals for militaries. So green would mean open source expert, etc. So that person will get a more qualified person for your specific problem, and this way we we will get in Linux installed. We have every semester we have installed 50 out of usually 51 laptops successfully, even the ones which are not supported. So you, you can trust us. We're going to be engineers someday. Um, yes, and if you have a, a HDD, like a, not an SSD, if you have an SSD you, SSD, you probably know what it is. If you don't know what you have, you probably have an HDD. Then it will be a good idea to, um, first of all, defragment it. That'd be nice. And also, uh, make a backup before you come, OK? Everybody say, make a backup. One, two, three. <laughs> yeah, it works. So you cannot tell me you haven't done one, OK? It's really important for me. I've only killed once a system in my life, and it, I had a backup. So as I would have lost one terabyte of data. It would have been horrible, all the family pictures. <laughs> it happens. It happens rarely, but when it happens, it's bad. So it only, we have only have two days. Uh, maybe it's not enough to get everybody through. Uh, I'd also have to say we have, unfortunately, a little bit problem with our uh, booking system. The Compi Campus thing most of you have probably signed up with uh, says it's full. Um, actually, this room, according to them, has 14, uh, 50 places. It's not quite right. It has 160. So we are not able to influence anything of that, to change the values. We don't even know how many people have signed up for the course. We can't see anything. It's completely intransparent to us. And when we try to reach somebody there, it takes usually a week of response time, which is uh, yeah, kind of stressful uh, yesterday. But if you don't have any free space on the internet, if it says booked out, come anyway. Have a look. See if it's really that busy. And you can always come the next day. As you see, it is today in one week, it's going to be the install event one. And you can choose. You can pick this that Thursday or the day just afterwards. Uh, so you have to, have to come to one of them. If you come the first time and something fails, like you run out of battery because you forgot to bring your charger, which is sometimes a problem that we have, then uh, you can always come to the second one. Try it again. Now, if that's not enough for you, we also have so-called Stammtische, which is basically we go have a drink, like a beer if you like beer, and we sit down together, have a good time, and then you bring your laptop, and we bring our laptops, and we... Discuss a little bit nerdy things if you want to, or we fix your problem. Anything. It's completely, there are no rules, and we do whatever we do. And you just contact us, tell us, hey, I want a Stammtisch to be organized because I have a problem. We're going to organize one. We're going to kick out something. We have a Simpa mailing list, simpa.ethz.ch, so you won't miss a thing. And uh, that way we just come together, have a good time together. Now, um, if you want to master your system afterwards, especially the console part, which is a little bit more advanced, but we, we assume that you know how to use a start menu. Uh, then you can come to our practice courses. And we're going to do two courses, which is one is built on top of the other one. Basically, everything we didn't cover in the first one will be covered in the second part. And uh, we're going to tell you exactly from zero 
everything that you need to know to be able to manage your own system. And if you run into a problem with that, come to our stump this year, right? That's the way it works. And then, if you are still, in, still interested about this, uh, any, many of you have given very good feedback to Christian two days ago. So, it might be good news for you that Christian is going to have another course, the expert course. And he's going to talk about, I think, NeuroCento, uh, kind of a specific scientifically based distribution, which is especially for scientists. Many of you are probably scientists here. Who's a scientist? Yeah, quite a few. Might be interesting for you that there are operating systems built for scientists. So he's going to talk about that. And that's going to be uh, on the 20th. Now, the Stammtische look a little bit like this. There's Beard. This is Christian. This is where we picked him up. It's exactly half a year ago. And maybe you're going to like us. Maybe you can, you can, you can by, the, by the way, at the end, cuddle tux if you want to. Uh, I have promised that to some people, so I have to say it. That's why some are here. So um, you can maybe fall in love with our penguin and say, we want to be part of this. We want to be part of the alternative. Maybe help other people install things, just discuss stuff, or help organizing things. There is a lot of things we do. We do like posters. We do a lot of paperwork. We do uh, a lot of technical stuff, et cetera, et cetera. We have, to, we have a lot of friends uh, at ETH in, in the, like for example, the people who are recording this, they do it for free. So we have a lot of nice people who help us. Uh, that's a good thing. And if you want to be part of that, you just come with us. And they're going to be your friends as well, right? <laughs> OK, I'm not that convincing with that. I'm sorry. If you don't have friends, get friends. <laughs> that's, that's what my, my operating system teacher told us. So the next uh, Stammtisch will be at the 29th of this month. And you know everything about it. Now, the uh, installed events, they look like that. This time, probably a little bit fuller. So it will be kind of, uh, you know, you can cuddle with each other because you're going to be so, so close. Many, many people. Are, I'm very, very surprised. There are about three times more people than last time. And then there's our website, of course. Write it down or just learn it by heart. I think by now you should know it. There is all the information that we have. Check out our simple list. And don't forget that we have demo computers you can play around with. And yes, that's about it. Uh, do you have any questions? It's Q&A now. No questions? Again, uh, thank, you very lot. Th thank you very much for coming. And I uh, wish you a very nice evening. I hope that, who, who of you feels now like they have touched the Linux? Oh, quite a few, OK. Now you can do the real thing. Hope you're going to have a lot of fun. and. Uh, See you soon. Yes. And we like you to fill it out so that we can even improve more. Just put it on the table down there. Thank you. Feedback is an important thing for us. We look at it for every single thing. Thank you.